I mean, no one plans to get sick. And yet, here we are. My name is Matthew Zachary. I survived cancer, a stroke, and COVID-19, and somehow I'm still here. I also survived our stupid broken healthcare system, and I want to help you survive it too. So let's go make healthcare suck less together. Because you know what? We're all out of patience. Hey, that's the name of the show. Hello, friends. Welcome back to the show. A quick reminder before we get started, as always, if you like the show, I hope you do, and you're on Apple Podcasts, how about a review, a rating, something nice maybe? Up to you. No love lost. On the show today, my brother from another mother, Steve Friedman, the Senior Advisor of Operations for SEER at the National Cancer Institute. Don't worry, We'll get to all the acronyms later in the show because I know you're looking forward to it. Steve was diagnosed with testicular cancer back in the 90s. He was in his 20s. So he brings with him a profound historical perspective of progress, not just for young adult cancer, but for cancer policy, research, and institutional growth at the federal level. Yes, it's true. The government can do great things. Sometimes. So while all those free AOL CDs littered the streets back in the 90s and drove us crazy, Steve put them to good use and found a community online. Who knew? Steve's storied career as a public servant, nonprofit leader, friend, mentor, cancer advocate, not just inspiring folks, it's a perfect example of how we can make the most of the time given to us and pay it forward to help the next you. Enjoy the show. Steve Friedman, Brooklyn, in the house. Thanks for coming on Out of Patience. Hey, good afternoon, Matthew. Long time coming to have you on the show, my friend. It's been a million years. We've known each other a million years. I really want to go down the rabbit hole for my listeners when I talk about what life was like as a cancer patient in the 90s, and you and I are part of that niche club. That's right. We are. And happy anniversary to you. It's the silver anniversary of Matthew Zachary this year, 25 years. And mine as well, coming up in uh, June 25th. Another thing we share in common besides yes. that Jewish DNA. <laughs> but you were diagnosed, were you already down in D.C.? Were you, where were you when you were diagnosed? I was down here in D.C. I uh, had finished up my undergraduate studies at George Washington University and was actually in graduate school at night while I was working full time, working towards my MHA, my master's in health administration. And I was a newlywed. I was just married about a year and a half uh, at the time of my diagnosis. Not that there's a good time for this to happen, but you had testicular. And it's always like, well, can't you just feel it yourself? Was it something like she discovered, you discovered randomly, you went to the doctor and it was there? So knowing us, you know, our personal relationship, you know that I'm a, a, an avid cyclist. And it was actually on a bike ride uh, at the end of the bike ride when I came home and was changing clothes when I noticed the sensitivity on my scrotum. And I attribute it to the wonderful conditions of the DC streets that I hit a pothole and maybe just had a contusion. And so I didn't really think much of it. And then a few days and, and then a couple of weeks went by, it wasn't getting any better. It was getting uh, larger, more sensitive, more swollen. And this is the difference between men and women. Guys will sort of burrow their heads down and not really do anything about it. And my wife said, uh, you need to go do something about that. It's not getting better. In the back of your mind, you think, oh, it's not going to be a good thing. I immediately went to my primary care doc. He turned around and referred me out, and we got ultrasound done. And of course, they, you know, the reading is a unspecified mass, and then it moves pretty quickly into getting you into surgery. With testicular masses, you don't do a fine needle biopsy. You do the orchiectomy. You remove the testicle, and then, uh, for lack of a better term, they throw it on a deli slicer, and then they do the biopsy there and, and come up with a, a diagnosis, and, and that's basically what happened. That would be the official things you can't unsee <laughs> ever on my show, so thank you for that wonderful visual. You're welcome. <laughs> like The question is, which deli are you going to for that curated, fine piece of protein? Well, where are we not going to? Which deli were you not going to after that? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Second Avenue Deli? No, this is the First Avenue Deli. <laughs> we're going to the First Avenue Deli. 
That's right. So here you are, 27 years old, newly married, testicular cancer. You had the orchiectomy? Had the orchiectomy. It took me seven years to meet another person like me who happened to have had brain cancer, and that's our mutual friend, Craig Lustig, who's been on the show before. Mm -hmm. How long did it take you to meet another guy with testicular cancer, and or did you go through the, I'm not a man anymore, I can't perform, my wife's not going to like me? This is the time in your life where you're supposed to be moving forward, and here you are. Right. So I mentioned that I was working full time in graduate school, part time, newly married. You're right. We were very much in a forward thinking posture. And this diagnosis came up and for lack of a better term, was a swift kick in the nuts. You know, it really kind of took the wind out of our sails. Uh, and, and the thoughts that we had about starting a family were obviously put on hold. And in terms of finding others, you know, testicular cancer, there is about 7,000 men a year in this country that are diagnosed with testicular cancer. And we're talking about being diagnosed in the early days of the internet, where the only thing that I could find online socially was an AOL chat room. And there were a bunch of guys in there that I was able to communicate with. All of a sudden, though, once you start talking about it, once you start asking around, you'd be surprised at how many people even if it's a one-off kind of situation, we're diagnosed. And so I happened to catch up with a old friend from growing up in Brooklyn. Her husband was diagnosed. They were living in Baltimore. Uh, shortly after I was diagnosed, uh, another friend from our neighborhood was diagnosed. And that got me thinking about cancer clusters down the road, which turned out to be a non-issue, but it was just a weird coincidence. And then about a year after I was diagnosed, my father-in-law was diagnosed. So it was a kind of a weird uh, pattern of people that all of a sudden came into my life having this diagnosis. So dial up cancer support. Dial up, right. Dial up cancer support. Right. A lot of beeps and boops on that one. So pop quiz. Do you remember your AOL handle? Oh, no. You have no. failed me for the last time. <laughs> I don't. For, for the I record. Don't. Now, there are still people out there that have AOL still, but that's not me. I don't. I cannot recall. All right. If you have AOL still and you're out there, get a hobby. <laughs> I lost like four <laughs> listeners by saying that. <laughs> yeah. My AOL handle in the 90s was Piano Man 529. Although- Well, that's not a surprise. No, it's not a surprise, but I didn't think to go online to look for brain cancer support. It just didn't even occur to me that that was a thing to do. So kudos for you for being innovative with Steve Case. You know, in Steve Case, AOL being a DC metro organization at the time, but I, I wish I could claim credit for being somewhat innovative and looking. It was, I remember around the time the, the TV show Friends was just starting or was going to be starting. There was a lot of promo around that, and they were using AOL as a platform. And so there were chat rooms. And so I didn't really think about it, but I was bombarded with these mentions of the Friends chat room. And it got me thinking, hey, maybe there's something, you know, significant that I could find online that might contribute to my knowledge about that, uh, about my diagnosis. And, and that's how I kind of fell into it. So what was peer support like in the 1990s on AOL? I, I've never asked that question before. I'm totally curious. You know, it was good. The chat room was quite active and there were a lot of guys out there that were supportive and there were a few spouses of men that were diagnosed, even a couple of parents, mostly mothers of the younger patients that were diagnosed, all seeking information and all trying to support each other. So it was a very, I would say, very productive uh, environment. And just to go even more niche, any cyclists who found their cancer while cycling? <laughs> uh, not at that time, but there's a, a more famous guy that found it a few years later. So, you know, but in that chat room, no, I, I may have stood out as the only cyclist. So what first got you into cycling and why is the answer you're a glutton for punishment? <laughs> well, I, I got into cycling as a way to rehab a knee injury and fell in love with the sport. And DC was and still is, it's improving, um, but was a fairly decent town to ride around in. And having gone to GW and having access to the roads downtown and then being able to hit some of the trails out of the downtown area, there's a lot to see and a lot to do by bike. And I've continued to grow with my love and passion for cycling. And I advocate for cycling, cyclist rights, and you know, good road sharing, engineering, and laws, and all that kind of stuff. It was just something that I sort of embraced. It, 
I'm not very good at team sports. I don't have a lot of eye-hand coordination. It was something that I think found me as much as I found that. And you rode across the country, as I recall. Didn't you do like a whole cross-country thing for research or funding or something? Yeah. So in 2003, uh, Lance Armstrong uh, put together with, you know, Bristol Myers Squibb. They worked together with a lot of his assets, Nike and others, to put together this cross-country ride to raise awareness for cancer research. And this was around the time where enrollment in cancer clinical treatment trials was really low. Uh, we didn't really have as many of the advances in the pediatric clinical trial arena that we uh, have now, and the enrollment was lower. And with adults, I mean, we're still suffering with you know 5% of eligible adults enrolling in clinical trials. It was even lower back then. And there was a fairly big effort on the part of the cancer advocacy community to try to raise that up. And there were a lot of different attempts at doing so. And and there was one moment that I remember that sort of was a huge step backwards, which was one of the national magazines had on its cover a picture of a human inside a cage like they were a rat, like a, they were a lab rat. And it made a reference to being a, a part of clinical research. And it was a really negative uh, visual. And I think a lot of people developed a very negative response to that. So this was one of several efforts uh, that I, and this was one that I was able to get involved with, where we were trained as pro cyclists, we were given access to coaching and great equipment. And um, we worked together as this team, it was 27 of us that were selected, it included cancer survivors, cancer researchers, uh, parents of children with cancer, uh, you know, that that was sort of the made up the group here. Trek Travel was a part of this from a logistics standpoint. Trek made the bikes. Nike was making the gear. We had all this stuff going on. And Bristol-Myers Squibb was involved because they had the chemotherapeutic agents that Lance was taking for his testicular cancer diagnosis, which is the basically the same chemo drugs that I had for my treatment. And so I got selected for this team, and we trained for about three months, flew out to LA, and we were broken into four squads, and we were doing a, a leapfrog type of thing. So each squad would ride three hours on, had nine hours off. We'd rotate around the clock. It was an amazing experience uh, as a survivor. It was a, an amazing experience. As a cyclist, it was like going to fantasy camp. And we rode through, I think, 14 states in the course of a week to end up at the Ellipse in D.C. behind the White House. And we had a uh, really great reception there. We had Ann Curry that was sort of the MC of that afternoon. And we had a great crowd that showed up. And along the way, we did a bunch of media stops. So I got to do one at Indiana University, which is a centers of excellence for testicular cancer because the physician that, uh, Larry Einhorn, the physician that developed the cisplatin-based chemo treatment uh, is there. And so that became the hub in many respects. And we did a great media tour stop there. And uh, it was just a phenomenal experience all around. I want to get to the entire conversation on the complexities that is a clinical trial after the break. But I want to focus on the one thing you said about fertility. This is one thing that I kept getting asked all the time at Stupid Cancer is why is young adult cancer better? Or I said, not better or worse. It's just <laughs> different because my gonads work and yours don't, grandma. Right. So <laughs> let's focus on the fact that, you know, the testicles are kind of the hot spot, literally for where the things happen. And then you lose those and then you can't ever have a kid biologically ever. You had one left. What was the conversation like with the doctor that performed the procedure or leading up to or after here are your options? So I was, I think, fortunate in the respect that my physician, my, my clinical team was keyed in on the fact that I was a, a young, newly married man with a, an eye towards starting a family. And so the conversations around fertility were very much in the forefront. Of, of all of this. And so the urgency was to have the orchiectomy, to, to get that done, to get it diagnosed. Uh, the fact that it was the orchiectomy for one, it wasn't bilateral, right? It was, we were taking out one testicle from a functional standpoint, one could work just as well as two. But uh, chemo, of course, can, you know, do a lot of damage in that area. And so from a from a uh, standpoint of, hey, let's be safe rather than sorry, 
the encouragement was to go to a sperm bank and go ahead and get that set up prior to starting chemotherapy. And so that, so that was an active discussion. And that was something that happened as almost a part of setting up the care that I was going to receive overall. So in all of my work at Stupid Cancer, we did study after study to see how often a young adult was made aware of fertility risk before starting treatment. And we found out that nine out of 10 women reported mm-hmm. that they were not read their Miranda rights, the, the ovarian Miranda rights. But nearly two thirds of men mm-hmm. were read their rights and given options to bank their sperm. Do you think that even in testicular cancer, it's higher because it's just so damn obvious? Yeah. I, well, I think I think I would agree with you. I think that it was it's because it's obvious. I also think that it's probably because of the percentage of men that are oncologists treating other men that are patients. And I think that it, it's it's that dynamic that probably results in a very high percentage of of men being told to go ahead and address fertility issues or what to do to, to address fertility issues. That's what I would attribute it to. So gender bias. Yeah. Unfortunate. So before we go to break, what was it like to hold your kid for the first time? Oh, it was amazing. I mean, uh, it was it was great. I was uh, I was actually at so I'm a volunteer EMT. I was actually on duty. It was July 4th, and my my kid was coming a few weeks early. My wife called me at the rescue squad and said, "Hey, I think we're having a baby now." And of course, everybody in the house woke up and said, all right, let's, let's go. We're all going to go. We're all going to get our ambulances and we're going to go get Steve's wife and we're going to bring her to the hospital and, and do this. And she's like, no, 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 just you. You come home and we're going to deal with this on our own. And, um, and because it was July 4th, we were working with a uh, solo practitioner who, of course, never takes vacations, but here we are delivering early. And so he was on vacation. The covering doc was none too happy that I was calling him on July 4th and uh, telling him that we're going to the hospital. He said, yeah, go for, go for a labor check. It'll be fine. He thought we were completely overblowing the situation. And I, and I got there to our hospital, which is just a few minutes from home. Uh, and I happened to know the nurse that was there through the rescue squad. And she said, you're a bit early. And I said, I know. And told her the situation and uh, they examined my wife and said, okay, well, if you want an epidural, now is the time. And they, she said, okay, go ahead and get everything set up. And they went out and all of a sudden she says, uh, hey, I'm, I'm pushing. And that was the end of the epidural. And so it was a very quick delivery in that respect. And my wife was a complete champ. And um, having that, my son come out, um, it, was, it was like the greatest blessing. Uh, the only thing that matched that blessing is having two other children uh, in the years to come. So it was phenomenal. And it was, it was very much like the, you know, the, the whole circle of life thing, uh, even from an exponential standpoint with the cancer experience behind me. Back with our guest after the break. Has your chronic illness made it difficult to continue working in the traditional way? Want to learn how to find and create flexible remote work that both accommodates your chronic illness and generates an income? Join the Patients Getting Paid membership, a community of chronicpreneurs where people just like you find workshops and trainings, weekly updated condition-specific gigs, twice monthly coaching calls, co-workings, accountability, and the kindest community to support you on your path to make money while working from anywhere and taking good care of yourself. Learn more or join us at patientsgettingpaid.com. So, Steve, I can't help but notice that you work for the National Cancer Institute. I do. 17 years now. 17 years at the NCI. What the hell is the NCI? (laughs) It's a government agency, of course. It's part of the National Institutes of Health. It is uh, or had the distinction of being the largest institute within the NIH. It may be second now, but um, still a very large place, a, a very complex place has a lot of different divisions and programs that do a lot of great work. It facilitates partnerships 
and relies on partnerships with folks out in the research community. Uh, we do a lot of research internally. We have, you know, the, the clinical center on campus that treats patients, but so much of what we do relies on the external, the extramural research community and those folks that really help support everything that we do. And we do a lot of different things. The NCI does things such as prevention clinical trials. There's treatment clinical trials. Uh, I spent the first half of my career at the NCI in the clinical trial environment and moved over about six years ago into the surveillance world. Uh, so I'm now with the surveillance research program. And I liken it in both of these experiences, I liken it to very much like a, a startup feel. There's a lot of activity. There's a lot of cutting edge activity. There's a lot of desire to be forward thinking. It's really a very dynamic environment. And it, I think it goes against the grain of how people typically classify uh, a government agency. And, and I take a lot of pride in being with, with the folks that I'm with. So you mentioned surveillance. I remember many, many years ago, someone said, oh, you should check the SEER registry. And like SEER, is that what they do with steak? <laughs> yeah. So SEER is an acronym for something I cannot explain right now. What does that mean? It is the Surveillance Epidemiology and End Results Program, S-E-E-R program. And it is a program that's been around. It was actually created uh, back in 1973 as a response to the National Cancer Act that President Nixon established or passed. So the SEER program, having been developed in response to the National Cancer Act, was a way to utilize the data that was coming up through all of these reporting facilities and providers, such as hospitals, pathology labs, up to where each state has a central cancer registry. And we're utilizing that data to help develop models to understand, better understand how treatment impacts patients and looking at incidence rates and survival rates. And there's a whole host of things that folks do. And we make, we make this data available to the uh, outside research community. And SEER data is heavily utilized in publications and in research, as I mentioned. And so it's really considered to be the gold standard in terms of surveillance data and that the way that program is, is run. And has been running for the last 45 plus years. So you worked for the National Coalition for Cancer Survivorship, you know, one of my hero organizations. We share a love for the late Ellen Stovall, mm -hmm. who I've mentioned a million times on this particular show. And you must be familiar with Dr. Julia Rowland as well, right? Of course. So one of the things I first learned about when I was sort of cultivated into this world of advocacy was that the NCI has an office of cancer survivorship, probably also made possible by some variant of the Cancer Control Act of 1971. Were you involved with that at all? Well, so having been a staff person at NCCS, and, and if you recall, it was my during my time there that we first met at one of the galas. You were one of the guests of honor, I guess. And um, we met initially through one of those functions. And it was a great experience. I got to learn a lot about cancer advocacy policy uh, as it pertains to cancer patients in the cancer community, and then understanding a bit more about how the, the community can coalesce together to, even though you're representing different cancers or different aspects of the cancer community, how you can coalesce together to really have a much stronger advocacy voice. And, and one of those efforts led to the establishment of the Office of Cancer Survivorship. And uh, Julia is amazing. She uh, was a an amazing person, great in her role as the uh, initial director of that office. And uh, in my time at the NCI, well, first through NCCS, I became introduced to her and developed, a, a, you know, a love for Julia. And then working at the NCI, especially when I moved over to the SEER program, our offices were right next to each other for a while. So I got to see her a lot. And, and on a personal level, uh, that was fantastic. So um, I just have nothing but the highest regard for her personally and, and the work that she did for OCS. So had you not gotten cancer, total hypothetical, do you think you would be working at the NCI now or were you already planning to do that with your bachelor's and master's degree? I mean, probably not, but who knows, right? I, you know, if you believe in everything happens for a reason or you are where you are regardless of what's going on, um, 
I was working in the managed healthcare industry uh, at the time of my diagnosis. That's where I was when I was in grad school. And so in my mind, that was the pathway that I was going to continue on. And I think what happened to me is typical of what happens to a lot of cancer patients, cancer survivors, which is you go through a very deep internal change and you reprioritize things and you create some life goals based on this experience. And uh, I was still going to remain in healthcare, but I obviously wanted to shift now into oncology. And um, this was a great opportunity to be able to join NCCS was a great opportunity to be able to start um, fulfilling that goal. So kind of a softball question. Do you think having had cancer and being a cancer survivor helped you do your job better or helped you inspire your teams to be more impactful at the NCI? I think so. I do think so. As a matter of fact, I just did a presentation last week about this year program uh, to an internal group that was coordinated by the new director of the Office of Cancer Survivorship. And I, I would pepper my talk, and I do this frequently, I'm sure a lot of people do, with my own personal experience. And I think it's important when you're in an environment like this to remind people that, hey, I'm one of the people that we're all working for. Uh, so I'm a face with the diagnosis. I'm not just a, a stat. I'm not just a number here. So it definitely has an impact. So let's jump down this horrible rabbit hole of clinical trials, because what you said in the first half of the show, that there was a magazine that listed like someone in a cage and we're guinea pigs and we shouldn't be experimented on. Is that a sign of the bygone times that we've moved beyond that? Or enrollment is still like, are we blaming people for not knowing it exists? Like, just because it is what it is, with this ridiculous boogeyman name to it, what's your take on the status of clinical trials? Well, I think in some ways, it's, it's much healthier, <laughs> if I could say it that way, than it ever has been. Uh, we look at pediatric cancers, and we see upwards north of 60%, some say 80% of pediatric cancer patients are enrolled in clinical trials. And there are certainly very specific reasons for why enrollment is so high there. But again, you know, it's very anemic on the adult side. And I think we're talking about 5% of adults enroll in cancer clinical trials. And I do think that there are some contributing factors there that we have not been able to overcome yet. But I think that there's a lot of efforts to overcome them. The NCI, for example, what used to be called the Cooperative Groups is now the NCTN, the National Cancer Trial Network. And um, there's a lot of efforts there to reach out to minority underserved communities to try to make sure that these clinical trials are fully representative of the demographics that make up this country, of the people that are actually getting diagnosed. And so these networks also rely on community doctors and community centers to help spread the word. So there, and I think with the, you know, the way that the internet has developed, the tools that are available there, this information is a click away. Now, it can be overwhelming. There's so much information. There are NCI funded trials, there are industry funded trials. There's a lot of information out there. It can be very overwhelming. As you know, when you get a cancer diagnosis, it's almost paralysis that you can experience at times. And how do you process that? And when you are dealing with a advanced stage cancer and you're dealing with being told that these treatments will not work for you and you should look at a clinical trial, it becomes incredibly overwhelming because you are fighting time. And so how do you collect information and process it with this perspective of time is slipping away on me and I have to, I have to mobilize and I have to get this done. Um, I frequently connect with people who are looking for information about clinical trials. And there are some really good resources out there, but uh, I think that it, there's still a stigma attached to it. And I think that um, people, adults need to reconcile the fact that clinical trials does not mean that you're going to get substandard care. And it's, that's, it's the complete opposite, actually. And so I think when people start to realize that, they're more willing and accepting of looking at and signing up for clinical trials. There has to be a better name. At the, I know you can't change the name because it's like embedded <laughs> in the sedimentary layers of the government, but there's yeah. got to be some funny, better, like enhanced cancer interrogation or something <laughs> that like gets people excited about it, not terrified by it. 
It would be. I mean, you know, look, the government's really good at creating acronyms. We, we swim with acronyms all day long. And maybe that'll be the homework for both of us to walk away from is to think of a really great name for this environment that we can apply instead of clinical trials. I'm going to head over to GoDaddy now and just register a whole bunch of domains for no reason. Do it. <laughs> All right, Steve, final question. So when I first met Craig Lustig, because yes. I think he sourced me out of the ether, he said something along the lines of, how would you like to be a cancer advocate? And I said, what the fuck is a cancer advocate? just don't know these things, right? How would you define cancer advocate? Because you didn't know you'd become one. You didn't ask. You wake up one day and say, I can't wait to lose one of my balls. Didn't <laughs> happen that way. You become an advocate by happenstance or you're kind of sucked into it for the right reasons. What was your path for that? And how would you define cancer advocate? It's a... <laughs> It's a really broad definition because it could really encompass anything. And I've, I've been fortunate that during my time at NCCS, for example, I got to work on, on the Hill, on Capitol Hill and lobby congressional folks to advocate for laws and policy that would better support cancer patients. And that's one definition. It could be setting up a nonprofit like you did, right? You set up a nonprofit to help people who were diagnosed and were lacking information or felt like they needed to take a more proactive stance uh, for their own care, for their own lifeline um, going through this experience. There's people that do merchandise. There's people that do events. I think that as you're bringing a positive look to the cancer community and the people that are being impacted by it, that's advocacy. The fact that you are looking to make it better easier, more straightforward, less overwhelming for the people that are diagnosed behind you all counts as advocacy. I, I don't think it's, you, can, you can't streamline it into one little definition. Well, I, I was able to do that. <laughs> Very successfully, I might add. It's like, make shit suck less for the next you. Yes. What do we win? <laughs> you won the prize of, of having this podcast now. Fantastic. Steve Friedman, Senior Advisor of Operations at SEER at the National Cancer Institute. Mensch, friend, survivor, awesome guy. Thank you so much for coming on Out of Patience. Thank you. Great to talk with you, Matthew. That's all for today, folks. If you like today's show, be sure to subscribe, leave a review, follow us on social, and tell all your friends to listen. Out of Patience with Matthew Zachary is a product of Offscript Media. Our executive producer is Matthew Zachary. Our senior producers are Brianna Seeley, Jen Orange, and Andrew McDowell. It is mixed and edited by Brianna Seeley. Our theme music is by the Mike Van Allen Quintet and by Mara. For advertising and media inquiries, email media at offscript.com. Hit us up at contact at offscript.com to share comments, feedback, and make recommendations. For more information, visit offscript.com.